Let's take our Bibles, if you would, and turn with me to Acts chapter number 4. Acts chapter number 4. As we look to the book of Acts, we are interested in first century Christianity. And we are interested in what the church looks like. Uh, this is the first church that we find here in the book of Acts, and we see how the church lived, what the church did, what was emphasized in the church. And uh, as we pay close attention to the first century, we ask ourselves uh, this question, what is the church supposed to be like in the 21st century? Now, what is interesting is you can certainly find probably hundreds, maybe thousands of books on just that subject. I'll say, well, this is what it needs to be in the 21st century. But I would hope that if we could not answer that question, that our instinct would be to say, well, let's look at what the Bible says. That we wouldn't run to the bookshelves in Christian stores, but that we would run to the Word of God and say, well, what is it that the church did? How did the church live? And we are drawn to the pages of this wonderful record in the book of Acts as we are interested in first century Christianity. Now notice in Acts chapter 4 as we begin, uh, we continue, I guess, where we left off last time. We come to verse number 13 of Acts 4. And Acts chapter number 4 is a very interesting chapter because it shows us the first ever recorded persecution of the church. Uh, and it is there right for us laid out, and we talked about as we begin the chapter, about the ancient condition of unbelief. Don't let it, anybody convince you that says, well, here we are in the 21st century, and we are modern people, we've learned some things, and so, uh, therefore, that's why we are not believing the gospel message. In the very first persecution of the gospel message, you find unbelief. And so unbelief is as old as the gospel. It is not something that pertains to the 21st century. It's always been around. And we find that the message was quite clear when Peter says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. And that's the name of Jesus Christ. We come now to verse number 13, and notice here, this is going to be the reaction or the reply of the people that had gathered together in this council. You have rich people there, you have the high priest, you have the Sadducees, the Pharisees, uh, all of the kindred of the high priest. And so you see this crowd, there's the powerful crowd, the authoritative crowd. They referred to themselves, remember last week, as the builders, those who had the answers to all of the uh, needs of society. But what they didn't want to happen is they didn't want to have the teaching and the preaching of Jesus Christ to go any further. Nothing has changed. Here we are in the 21st century, and uh, humanity remains in the same condition. And we come to verse number 13. Notice what the Bible says. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled. And they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And beholding the man which was healed, standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But that it spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, 
They let them go, finding nothing how that they might punish them because the people, because of the people, for all men glorified God for that which was done. For the man was above 40 years old on how this miracle of healing was showed. I want to draw your attention, if you would, to verse number 20 and bring your attention to the words of Peter and John. And here it is. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. I want to preach on this thought as we consider the reply of, of Peter and John. We cannot but speak. We cannot but speak. I think these two, these uh, three were four words, <laughs> two, three, four. These four words communicate appropriately what New Testament Christianity is all about. It's encapsulated in those four words. We cannot but speak. In this first persecution in Acts chapter number 4 that is recorded in the church, now we know as we study the Word of God that the men of God and the people of God who have sought to live a life pleasing to God have always been persecuted, even in the Old Testament. And as we come, even when Paul and Peter preach, he says, what you're doing here in this persecution is what your fathers have always done. And the truth is, as we come here to Acts chapter 4 and we see the church and its first persecution, we have learned some valuable lessons. And we come to this chapter where they are told basically to be silent about the name of Jesus Christ. We have learned, based upon verse 2 of chapter 4, that they were grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. What is interesting in this chapter is they're, they're not bothered by the miracle. They're bothered by the fact that Peter and John were teaching and preaching Jesus. That, that's what bothered them. And they couldn't stand that. And so what we find here after basically Peter... He puts them on trial, and he says, uh, verse 11, This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders. And you see, they could not stand that these ignorant men were teaching and preaching the people about Jesus Christ. They saw themselves as builders. They saw themselves as the answers of society. And they had done away with the stone which is Christ, who has made the head of the corner. And uh, things have not changed today. People today who are in political power, they look at themselves as having the answer. That's how they always speak, do they not? Hey, look to us. We'll tell you how to live. We'll tell you how to have a better life. And they all see themselves as builders while all along discounting Jesus Christ, the preaching and the teaching of Jesus Christ. And so here it is. We are in Acts 4 and we are here in the 21st century and nothing has changed. But there are several things that happen as we think about the threat that is made to them. They're going to be threatened. They're going to be told not to teach and to preach anymore in the name of Jesus Christ. And Peter and John simply reply by saying, If it seem evil in the sight or uh, right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge you. And the trouble is, I think that now in the 21st century, our society has done a very good job at silencing Christians. That's what they try to do in the first century, and that is still what they're trying to do today in the 21st century. But I believe our reply, if we are going to be New Testament Christians, if we are going to be a first century church in the 21st century, we have to have this boldness or this attitude or this disposition where we say, we cannot but speak. That is New Testament Christianity. And so as we look to this passage, let's ask the Lord to help us. I want us to consider as we look at this um, uh, verse 13 down to verse number 22, we notice first of all the examination of the messengers. Uh, Peter and John are under scrutiny in verse number 13, and they're being examined. And uh, now that Peter kind of confronted them about them being builders and how they had uh, done away with Jesus Christ, they did not want Jesus to be the answer. They wanted the miracles to keep coming in. They just wanted to take Jesus out of the picture. And uh, we find that based upon the boldness of Peter and John, verse 13, the Bible says when they saw the boldness of Peter and John 
and perceived that they were ignorant and uh, unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. I think verse 13 we could say, here is for you authentic Christianity. Authentic Christianity. Notice, they saw their boldness. They perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men. And they marveled and they took knowledge that they had been with Jesus. Authentic Christianity right there in verse 13. I want you to notice several things about the examination of those messengers. And I could take it, if you would, by uh, the... Uh, the perspective of Peter and John, but what we find in verse number 13 is the perspective of the people who were in the council. Verse 13 is the perspective of the builders. Those who looked at these two Christian men, and they're making a, an examination of those men, and they're assessing these men. I wonder today if the world were to assess us. If the world were to look at First Aid Baptist Church, would they say the same thing? That's what the world does here in verse 13. Notice the examination of the messengers. First of all, we consider they observed their assurance. They observed their assurance. Notice the first thing we see in this examination is now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. Now, if you remember in this chapter, you have uh, the high priest, the captain of the guard, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. Um, we read of Alexander and John, who what we see is they perhaps were very wealthy Jews who had uh, political influence. And so we see these people who were all, by the way, always opposed and always hated each other. Now they're all joining forces against Jesus Christ. And now they're all getting along because they want to rid society of the name of Jesus Christ, which has always been done throughout the century. And the first thing they notice about them is they observe their assurance. They observe with the word that it uses, their boldness. Can you imagine here, there's uh, perhaps hundreds of people gathered around, and here's Peter and John, and this man who was lame, who's now walking around, he's been praising God. All three of them are sitting here in the midst of this crowd, and they're being judge and they're being examined and here's peter says here uh look you've set uh you've set it not the stone uh you builders you who think you're the answer to society uh you have uh, discounted jesus christ and uh, uh he is basically confronting them about uh, about who they are and about the fact that jesus christ is the answer and they didn't expect that that's a, that is apparent because the Bible says they saw their boldness. They did not expect boldness. They expected Peter and John to shrivel up and to say, oh, okay, okay, well, we're not going to teach and preach in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, I'm sorry that we have offended you. Uh, I'm sorry that you don't like the message. That's not what happened. As they were being examined, they observed their assurance. They were bold as they were speaking. And by the way, I think that it is very apparent that uh, nothing happened until the power of the Spirit came down of Pentecost, which launched out the church who was uh, uh, working in the power in reliance upon God, and they were preaching Jesus Christ. The miracles were never emphasized. It was always the preaching and the teaching of Jesus Christ. And here they are in a complete assurance. They are bold, and that is what we see about New Testament Christianity. We are here in the 21st century, and it seems that uh, Christians have become quiet. Where they're unwilling to be offensive or, you know, to be bold in their proclamation. Well, you know, let me suggest something to you. Uh, you know, uh, you can take it or leave it. That is not the attitude of Peter and John. And so we see, first of all, they observe their assurance, but then secondly, they objected to their abasement. The Bible says, verse 13, and they, the second thing, they perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant. So this was their thinking. This was their mindset. As they look at Peter and John, not only were they bold, they had this assurance about them, but we see that these men did not go through their schools. They were not trained by their priests. Uh, they were not recognized, if you would, in society as builders. 
So they should not be having any place of authority to teach and to preach, but here they are, and they are perceived, they, they basically objected, they were not pleased to the fact that these were unlearned and ignorant men, and yet they were teaching the people. The Bible says that they marveled. And it was like, uh, and in the structure in society at that time, Peter uh, or people could not come into the temple and start preaching and teaching Jesus Christ without going through their schools. They had to have been recognized. They had to have position that were granted to them. Uh, what is interesting is that's what Jesus did. Remember, he would go into the temple and he would stand up and he would teach and preach. Well, he was not supposed to because he was not supposed. He was not recognized. He was not uh, a one who was rabbi, or if you will, who he, he didn't have a diploma. He was not supposed to do that. And here's Peter and John. They're in the temple and they're doing the same thing. They're teaching and preaching Jesus Christ, and they don't like that. Why? Because these are supposed to be uh, ignorant. These men are not supposed to be authorities. They are unlearned. They haven't been trained by us. They don't know. And by the way, that is still what the world does. You preach the message of the gospel and the world says, well, uh, who are you? You're not a scientist. You don't have the answer. You're, you're not a philosopher. You haven't published a book. Uh, uh, you don't need to be bold like that. Uh, look to the world. They have the answers. Look to the doctors. Look to the philosophers. Uh, look to the intellectuals. And these are the people who you look up to. Look at the people who are trying to uh, develop civilization and march. And look, these are the cream of the crop. These people have the answers. And... Ignorant men and unlearned men do not be, uh, need to be part of the conversation. They should ju just be uh, uh, find their corner and uh, their place, and they need to be told what to do. They don't need to tell anybody what to do. And certainly not that Jesus Christ is the only answer. You see, because we are broad in our thinking, and we don't want to be limited. That's what they still say. Oh, you're so narrow-minded. Open yourself up. Broaden the horizon. Broaden your mind. Be trained by us. Let us tell us what you need to know. So, we see here that they observed their assurance. They objected to their abasement. Thirdly, they opposed their association. And this is the biggest thing. This is where the trouble is. Notice verse 13. After they marveled, they took knowledge of them. What, what, what did they assess that they had been with Jesus? Now, what is interesting is these people that were judging them, these were the people who, remember, had been judging Christ. When Jesus Christ was teaching, remember, these were the lawyers, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the Herodians. All, these are all the people who tried to trick Jesus Christ. They tried to stump him with some questions. They were never able to do that. Every time they find themselves to be confounded by the words of Jesus Christ. And here, the, there's a group of people now that Jesus, if you would, has gone out of the scene. These are people who are still preaching and teaching in the name of Jesus Christ. And their mindset is, man, these guys... They've been around Jesus Christ. <laughs> They're talking just like he's talking. You remember what Jesus says, I said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. I am the light of the world. I am the bread of life. He declared himself to be the answer to a society. He came to not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And so here they are presenting the same answer. And as, it is as if, they're saying the exact same thing that Jesus Christ said. Well, in the 21st century, unfortunately, many churches have changed the message of the church. Churches have gone, they're consumed with some social agenda. Uh, they look to the political scene and say, oh, look at what's going on in politics. Let's be involved within that. And the church has nothing to do with politics. Uh, we come to the Word of God and we have a message. We do not associate with some government. We associate with Jesus Christ. That is who we are interested in. We are duplicating His message. We are not trying to uh, take on the agenda of some so society uh, structure. We are taking on the agenda of Jesus Christ. And so here what they truly opposed was their association with Jesus Christ. Isn't it interesting in society that... 
uh, you can bring in religious people who are in charge of churches. You can have the, even the Pope coming and, and speak to the United Nations and they, they speak about global warming and the social agendas and the inequalities and the injustice and everybody rises up and claps to this religious leader who has taken on the agenda of society. But you bring in, a, and I don't imagine I'll ever be invited to speak at the United Nations, but if I would have the opportunity to speak, you know what I would speak on? The Lord Jesus Christ. But I can guarantee you this, there would be no applause. Not one. No standing ovation. Why? Because they oppose, they opposed their association. They took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And I ask myself this question, as we are here in the 21st century, if the world was to examine us, would they observe our assurance? Would they object to our abasement? And would they oppose our association? And I tell you, they still do. We see, first of all, the examination of the messengers. Secondly, we see the evidence of the miracle. They're going to bring the miracle into the scene now, and they're going to, uh, because that's the, that's the problem. You see, somebody's life has been changed. And so that's really the struggle. You see, if there was no miracle, they were thinking, ah, you know, that'll be pretty easy because nobody's kind of stirred up about this whole thing. But because of the miracle, everybody's flocked towards them. And now everybody's listening to them earlier. The Bible says 3,000 believed. That's a problem for them. They can't influence the people. And so notice what, they, what the trouble is, verse 14. And beholding the man which was healed standing with them. So apparently that lame man was actually there with Peter and John. And he's probably still praising God because that's why. Can you imagine? For 40 years, he had been lame. He had been brought up by his family member to the beautiful gate, begging every single day for money. And that's how he lived his entire life. And now he's able to walk around. I, I can imagine there's some excitement about him. And I, I would imagine that at this time, he's kind of perplexed. What's going on? Like, why are we sitting on trial here? I did nothing wrong. I was healed. All I did was praise God. And the Bible says, uh, well, verse 14, they could say nothing against it. Well, yeah, obviously. All of these guys probably gave money to that lame man. Try to write, make alms before men. They try to make sure that whatever the cup was sitting there, that it would slam that so that everybody around them could see that they were giving money to that lame man. That's how they did. They lived for the praise of men, not for the praise of God. And... As we consider, verse 15 says, But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that indeed a noble miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem. We cannot deny it. But that it spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. I'm thinking, where's the connection? Do you see that? Do you see what they say? The miracle is spreading. Oh no, what's the problem? Tell them not to speak in the name of Jesus Christ anymore. And I'm thinking, what does it have to do with a miracle? You see, they didn't, have, they didn't have any problem with the miracle. If Peter and John had done the miracle and had said nothing, they wouldn't have any problem. But the problem was the people were flocking to them because of the miracle, and then they were preaching Jesus. You see, the, the emphasis of the book of Acts is not upon any miracle or signs or wonder. The emphasis of the word of God is always and only on the preaching and teaching of Jesus Christ. And we see the evidence of the miracle. Notice several things about the evidence of this miracle. The Bible says, or we, let me mention number one, in the evidence of the miracle, we see, first of all, the miracle was unpleasant. Notice verse number 14. Beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. Now, the, the, the words are, are pretty important here because they could say nothing against it. You know, these people were used to stomping people, right? Trying to ask the difficult question, trying to stomp somebody. But here they're sitting in a place where they can't say anything. And they couldn't stand it. You remember what happened to the layman in chapter 3? He was praising God. And all the people, what were they doing? They were all praising God. So the thing is like, well, we can't say, well, that's of the devil because they're praising God. And they, they did that, by the way, with Jesus Christ. 
he does that by Beelzebub. And so here, there's really no argument. So to them, this miracle was unpleasant. They didn't like the fact that this miracle was done. They wished that there was some way out they could get out of it, but they couldn't. They could say nothing against it. We see not only the miracle was unpleasant, but also the miracle was unsettling. Notice verse 15 and 16. The Bible says, But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves. You see what happened? They, 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 they had to say, okay, let's, uh, we need to have a discussion here. Okay? Take them out of the room. And now they're all kind of talking to one another. Why? Because they're unsettled. They don't know what to do. They, they, they can say nothing against the miracle. And verse 16 saying, what shall we do with these men? Translation, how can we silence them? How can we shut them up? Well, isn't that interesting? Here we are in the 21st century. And it seems that there's people who are in power, who are in authority, who are interested even today to still shut people up. We got to silence people. We, we can't uh, uh, have people speak. We, we, we have to censor them. We have to quiet them. And we see because the miracle was unsettling. But there's a third thing we notice about the miracles. The miracle was undeniable. Verse 16 for that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all men that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. The miracle in Acts chapter 3 is a picture, because if you remember when uh, they ask, by what power have you done this? You remember what Peter says? By the name of Jesus Christ. And then he turns the, their attention, he says, and there is none other name of on heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. So really, the miracle was a picture of what Jesus Christ could do in the life of the man that is lost. He was lame from birth. So are we in sin from our very mother's womb. The Bible says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sin. And so the lame man is a representation of sin in the life of man that he cannot rid himself of uh, until Jesus Christ comes on the scene. And here they were, he was healed by the name of Jesus Christ. And they go on to say that the salvation is only found in the person of Jesus Christ. And what is interesting today is the world is bothered. Now you say, well, what do you, well what's the miracle today? The miracle is this changed lives. I would imagine if I go around the room and, and I have the privilege to know many of your testimonies and how you came to know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, and many of you could stand up here at this very moment and spend an hour, two hours, and you can talk about all your life before salvation. And then you can talk about what happened when you met Jesus Christ and you became a Christian. And your life changed. How was that done? By a miracle of regeneration. You were saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, and your life changed, and the world looks at that, and the world cannot dispute it. The world's perplexed. Even many people have family members who say, well, I can't believe what's happened. Uh, they often say, well, you've uh, joined a cult, or something bad has happened in, in your life. Uh, are, are you okay? What's going on in your life? And they, they seem to, they can't stand the change. They can't say anything against it because they're, they're thinking to themselves, well, we oppose it, but yet it's actually good for them. They're actually living a life that is decent and moral and good. And they don't like it. You see, things have not changed. Isn't it amazing that someone who maybe uh, was uh, an angry person, who uh, was uh, 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 drinking, who was violent, who was... Um, uh, uh, you know, in conflict with his family, who was not raising his children for the Lord, who was immoral, and then that person gets saved, and then their lives change, and they, they stop doing certain things, and they become moral, and they become good, and uh, because of the change that Jesus Christ has brought about in their lives, and yet to the world, to the people, it's unpleasant? It is. It is not only unpleasant, it is also unsettling. It bothers them that God has changed the life of someone without them. <laughs> you see, the world wants morality. They just don't want God. 
The religious leaders want to make a society a utopian society, but they want to do it without God. And it can never happen. So the miracle is unpleasant, is unsettling, and uh, the truth is it is undeniable. It's, you, you, you can't talk about it. You can't speak against it. God changed their lives. Some of you perhaps you used to go and uh, work from Monday to Friday, and then on the weekend you just splurge and sin, and do whatever you wanted on the weekend, and now what, something has happened, God has changed your life, and you go to church on Wednesday, and then you go to church on Sunday? And now you don't waste your money on, on bulls and drugs, now you, you, you bring your money and you give it to God. <laughs> See, the world can't deny that. A change has been wrought. And so we see the Evidence of the miracle. So we see uh, the examination of the messengers, the evidence of the miracle. Uh, but thirdly, we see the enmity with the message. Notice verse number 17. And here it is. is obviously, they could not deny the miracle. But notice what happens, verse 17. But that it spread no further among the people. And let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. What did, did they not want to spread? The name of Jesus. There's nothing they could do about the miracle. What they wanted to stop was Jesus. But remember, there is no other name. There is no other way. There is no really other way for this man to be healed but by the name of Jesus Christ. So there is no salvation apart from the person of Jesus Christ. So we see the enmity or the problem they had is with the message. I want you to notice three things about their enmity with the message. First of all, they wanted to curb the spread. We need to make it stop spreading. Let's, let's, look, it's already gone out. 3,000 people have believed. All Jerusalem now is all talking about what happened. People are probably at this very moment flocking to the temple, trying to either see another miracle or to hear the preaching of Peter and John. And so what they're wanting to do at this point is they want to curb the spread. We can't let it get out of hand. We can't let more people hear about it. And so we have to curb the spread. Why? Because there's an enmity with the message. Often you would find in the world that if a lot of people can have uh, some moral conversation. Isn't it interesting that there's even laws within state houses and within even our uh, military forces those who are chaplains, now uh, they can pray, they can make a, a, or say a beautiful soliloquy, but you cannot mention Jesus. Isn't that interesting? They can mention every name imaginable apart from the name of Jesus Christ. We have uh, people now who are uh, who are so-called preachers who uh, stand up and they 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 uh, they give those uh, speeches and their and their prayer and uh, and uh, they 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 want if you would there's a form of religion there and people are okay with that as long as it does not spread the name of Jesus Christ. You can pray and end your prayer with Amen and a woman, and that will not bother the world. But if you finish your prayer with the name of Jesus, everybody's going to rise up and stand up in arms and say, you can't do that. And we say, why? I will tell you why. Because they're trying to curb the spread. It's always been that way. Not only do we see they wanted to curb the spread, secondly, they wanted to censor the Savior. Verse 17, the Bible says, let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. So... Not only curb the spread, we have to stop the influence of these men, but also we have to censor the Savior. We have to cut off his name. In other words, Peter and John, we'll see later, you can do whatever you want to do. Just don't speak in his name. Don't say the name of Jesus. Say, Pastor, do you get together with like different pastors in the area and you know there's those different fellowships? And I'll tell you why I don't. Because if I, you know, to prayer meeting, interdenominational prayer meetings, I don't go to those. Why? Because people are praying to Mary. 
Uh, people are praying to uh, gods that I've never heard of. And I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. But if I go to these meetings and I mention Jesus Christ, everybody's like, oh. what happened? He said Jesus. He said the name of Jesus. He's not supposed to do that. Isn't it amazing that perhaps here it was direct, but today it is still going on, even though it is subtle. And the trouble today is that Christians are okay with that. Well, yeah, we don't want to offend them. Well, you know, I mean, yeah, you know, let them discover Jesus Christ. If you don't mention his name, they're not going to discover anything about Jesus Christ. So they wanted to curb the spread. They wanted to censor the Savior. Thirdly, they commanded their silence. Verse 17, that they speak to no man in this name. Verse 21, notice, so when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing, how that they might punish them because of the people, for all men glorified God uh, for that which was done. So, this is the enmity with the message. Let's curb the message. We can't let it spread any further. Let's censor the Savior. You cannot speak in his name. And so, uh, I guess there is no other way to do it but to command their silence. Let's tell them to be quiet. Don't speak in the name of Jesus anymore. Now, that is the, if you would, the perspective of the world the religious leaders gather there, right? The examination of the messengers, uh, the evidence of the miracle, and the enmity with the message. But there's one more thing I want us to see, and that is Peter and John's answer. And that is the explanation, or we could say the example of the messengers. Hey, notice verse 19 and 20. But, every time there's a but in the Bible, maybe we should circle it. But. And we could say, I want to put it this way here, before we read it. But, here, let's look at it. New Testament Christians, right here. You ready? We want to be New Testament Christians? Come on, come on, let's see. Let's see what Peter and John said. Let's pay attention here to what they see. Here is their explanation, or the response, or the example we have of these men. Verse 19. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God, to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. Do you know what the problem today is in the 21st century? Why there is not authentic Christianity today is because the church rather listen to men than to listen to God. Well, you know, look, this is what the world says. And, you know, uh, no, the Bible says we're supposed to, uh, you know, reverence those in our authority. Authorities are ordained of God. And so we just want to be submitted, you know. Their reply was simple. You judge. You judge. The world, you judge. And by the way, I think this is a good reply for us to the world. World, you judge. But the fact is, do we, even, uh, do we even say that? Do we even say to the world when the world says, oh, you got to be uh, censored, you got to be silent, you, uh, we, we can't have this message spread any further, and do, do, uh, is our reply to say, well, look, you may want this, but the truth is we're going to answer to God one day, and uh, the truth is I'm not going to stand before you uh, one day, and so you judge. If you were in my position, and you knew what I know, and you know what God commanded me to do, and you know what the name of Jesus Christ means to a lost and dying world, you judge, is it right to listen to God, or should I listen to you? You make the call, you make the judgment. It is as if to say, if I'm right, which I am, <laughs> you tell me what I should do. Listen to you or God? It's a rhetorical question. Well, listen to God. But he says something in verse 20. He says, for, and here is uh, New Testament Christianity, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Uh, if it is unclear, let me put it in this way. We can't stop talking about Jesus Christ. That's just the, the fact. The reason why we are bold in speaking in the name of Jesus Christ 
And the reason why you may not like the fact that we are unlearned and ignorant men, and the fact that we are associated with Jesus Christ, and the fact that the miracle makes you uncomfortable, it unsettles you, and that you cannot deny it, and uh, noting that you don't want the message to spread any further, and they're trying to censor the Savior, and you're trying to commend our silence, we just have one thing to you, we, we can't help ourselves. There's really nothing for else, there, there's nothing else for us to do. You remember when Jesus Christ was teaching and preaching, and uh, he looked at Peter and he says, Is this a hard saying for you? Uh, are you going to go as those other people that left that couldn't bear to hear the message? And uh, Peter, you remember what he said? Where shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. What Peter was saying is there's nowhere else for us to go. There is no other truth than the truth we find in your word. And that's our explanation. You may want us to be silent, but the truth is we cannot be silent. That is New Testament Christianity. And I wonder what has happened? Is that us? Why can you why do you keep touch, talking about Jesus? I'll tell you why. I can't help myself. That's the truth. What else do you want me to talk about? You're, you're, you're talking about salvation, talking about eternal life. Uh, what else is there to talk about? You see, that, will, that message will never commend the standing ovation of the world. But I believe with all my heart, that it commands the standing ovation of God. Who are we going to obey? Man? Who does not have the answers? Or God? I think we know the answer. The trouble is when it comes to practicality. Do we fear man more than we fear God? And so may the Lord help us. I could go on, but I will stop. Think about those words of Peter. We cannot but speak. We cannot but speak. You see, I don't think that Peter was this brash, ugly, angered man. He was just a man that says, I, I can't help it. I have the truth that the world needs. What else could I speak of? Who else could I speak of? You see, that is what the first century church looks like. If the world, if you look at anybody who calls themselves Christians or preachers, and the world comes and stands at the United Nations or in the joint session of Congress, and everybody claps and cheers, I will tell you that is not New Testament Christianity because the world will always revile the name of Jesus Christ. And so may the Lord help us to be in that same position as Peter and John and say we cannot but speak. May the Lord help us. New Testament authentic Christianity.